Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to my crash course in formal logic. In this part, we're going to cover rules for categorical syllogisms. They're technical rules, but if you memorize them and get them under your belt, you'll be able to spot immediately by looking what is and is not a valid uh, categorical syllogism. This is going to be a pretty short lesson, but it'll be pretty technical, too. So hold on to your hats, and uh, if you have trouble with this lesson, don't worry. You've learned a lot of skills so far, more than enough for an introductory level college class. Now, the four rules that we're going to learn in this apply to... Uh... So each of these rules presupposes already that you're not going to be committing the existential fallacy. If you want to remember another rule called the rule of existential fallacy, all that means is don't draw particular premise, uh, conclusions from universal premises, at least if you're doing Boolean logic. But you could treat that as a fifth rule if you want. I'm just going to treat this lesson as covering four rules. Now, as we said before, when you're doing a deduction, the conclusion is already to be contained somehow within your premises. So that tells you already that if the con uh, conclusion is thus contained, then you, if your conclusion says a lot about some term, your premises are better to say a whole lot about that term as well. A second thing you need to remember is that the, you better have a strong middle term, a strong link up term. So I'll return to B in just a second. Let's focus on a. If your conclusion says a lot about something, your premises had better do so too. You guys remember this uh, issue? Distribution? Uh, which proposition distributes which term? Uh, A propositions distribute the subject, E distributes both, I distributes none, and O distributes the predicate. That last one was the hardest one to remember. And uh, it was also confessed in the lesson in which we covered this topic that it was a pretty boring one. Why should we care about it? Well, the problem, the issue is really that distribution measures how much information about a class or a term the proposition using that term or class contains. So that's a measure of how much you can deduce from that. So let's go into more detail on this topic. So as I said before, if you say a lot about a term in the conc uh, conclusion, that is, you distribute it in the conclusion, then you'd have better say a lot about it in the premises. That is, you'd have better distributed it in the premises at least once. So look at this uh, argument. All ladies are human beings and some gentlemen are not ladies. Does it follow that some gentlemen are not human beings? Boy, I hope not because those premises are true, but the conclusion looks ridiculously false. So what went wrong here? The problem is the term human beings in the conclusion. It is distributed here. Remember, O sentences distribute their predicates. Now, was human beings distributed anywhere in the premises? It could only have been distributed in premise one, but it's not. Uh, A sentences do not distribute their predicates. Or consider this argument. No gentlemen are ladies, and all ladies are human beings. Oh, two true premises once again. Conclusion, no human beings are gentlemen? Now that sounds completely false. What happened here? Well, it looks as though we have a term, again, human beings, that is distributed in the conclusion. Was that term distributed in premise number two? No, it wasn't. Now, there are names for these sorts of fallacies, and, uh, well, whenever you distribute in the conclusion but you didn't distribute the term in the premises, you're doing something illicit. So that seems like an appropriate way to describe the fallacy. But whether or not it's an illicit major or minor depends upon what's going on in the conclusion. In the conclusion of the first argument, the major term failed to be distributed among the premises. And in the second argument, it was the minor term, human beings, that fail to be distributed among the premises. So whether it's illicit major or minor, well, look at the conclusion in order to find those terms, or to find the appropriate term to use. And if you're ever in doubt, you can always go to your old standby the Venn diagrams. So I'm going to go ahead and diagram the first argument. All ladies are human beings. Fill in four and seven. Some gentlemen are not ladies. Oops, floating X. That's a dead giveaway that we've got an invalid argument. Recall that? Let's go ahead and move down to uh, argument number two. No gentlemen are ladies, so we'll block in five and six, and all ladies are human beings, so we'll block in seven and six. Does it follow that no human beings are gentlemen? Is there any room left for there to be something in the green circle and the red circle at the same time? Yes, there is. I just highlighted it in section two. The argument is invalid. Fallacy of illicit major, fallacy of illicit minor. 
Here's an example so that you can get some practice. How about this? All NBA players are athletes and all athletes are healthy people. Does it follow that all healthy people are NBA players? Well, the premises look true and the conclusion false, so you should suspect invalidity. Which of the two fallacies we've studied so far do you think this commits? I'll give you a second. All right, time's up. The only the thing that should come to mind is there's only one thing distributed in that conclusion, right? A sentences distribute their subjects. And was healthy people distributed in premise number two? It absolutely wasn't. That's the fallacy of illicit minor. Here's another one to give you a little bit of practice. All mountain goats are mammals? True enough. And some mountain climbers are not mountain goats? Well, I've given you a picture of one over to the right. Does it follow that some mountain climbers are not mammals? That conclusion is very likely false, so go ahead and try to figure out what went wrong with this argument. And your time is up. Look at the conclusion. What got distributed there? If you remember, O sentences distribute their predicates. And was that distributed among the premises? It was not distributed in premise number one. This is the fallacy of illicit major. And if you're ever in doubt, remember, you can always jump back to your old standby, the Venn diagram. It'll do the job just as well, telling valid validity from invalidity when it comes to categorical syllogisms. Well, I promised you two uh, rules regarding distribution. We know that if the conclusion is contained in the premises, A, your con if your conclusion says a lot about some term, your premises had better do so too, otherwise you'll commit the fallacy of illicit major or illicit minor. Secondly though, your pre if your premises had better have a strong link up or middle term. In other words, just to put it bluntly, you ought to distribute your middle at least once in the premises. Recall again, the links in a, the terms in a categorical syllogism function kind of like links. And that being the case, the middle term is crucial to linking up the other two. You might even think of it something like this. So try this argument on for size. And remember the rule, the premises must distribute the middle term at least once. That makes the middle term at least strong enough in those premises to make a, a good tight bond, so to speak, between the major and minor term in the conclusion. All ladies are human beings and all gentlemen are human beings. Does it follow that all ladies are gentlemen? Well, you know better than that. What went wrong here? Notice that in each case, we have A sentences for premises, and A sentences distribute their subjects, not their predicates. Consequently, we have a bad argument due to the fallacy of undistributed middle. The middle was never distributed, not even once, among the premises. And if you want, you can always use your old standby the Venn diagram. So if we say all ladies are human beings, I'll go ahead and block in sections one and two, and all gentlemen are human beings. I block in sections two and three. Does it follow that all ladies are gentlemen? No, it did not. Uh, we still have a section four right here that I just highlighted that shows there's a place for uh, ladies who are not gentlemen. In fact, I'll bet that's a very populated section four. Well, that concludes all of our lessons regarding distribution. Remember the two rules. If you're gonna say a lot about a term, distribute a term, in the a conclusion, make sure you've done it at least once in the premises, and make sure the middle is distributed at least once in the premises. Now, moving on to talk about positive and negatives, the quality of sentences. Negatives are hard to draw any conclusions from. From two negatives, first rule, nothing ever follows. You can't get a conclusion from totally negative premises. And if you have a, uh, one negative in your uh, premises, you can only conclude a negative. Now that's an interesting rule. From a combination of positive negative premise, you get a negative conclusion every single time. So we can abbre uh, abbreviate the rules, or rather illustrate them, kind of like this. From two negatives, you get nothing. You get nothing from nothing. But for any combination, negatives follow. So when negatives do get involved in the uh, argument, you're either going to end up with nothing or negatives, and that's just the way negatives work when they're premises. Try this one. No ladies are gentlemen. Some humans are not ladies. 
an E sentence for a premise, and an O sentence. Does it follow that some gentlemen are not humans? It may seem plausible to think this follows because you're drawing a negative conclusion, but from two negative premises, you can't even get a negative conclusion. You get nothing from nothing there. And if you want me to prove it once again, we can go to our old standby, the Venn diagram. No ladies or gentlemen will say, so we'll block out four and five. And some humans are not ladies. Looks like we got a floating X that's going to show up there. And floating X's are always characteristic of invalid arguments. However, what happens if you get a negative premise and you mix it with a positive premise? Well, if you have one negative premise, you get a negative conclusion and vice versa. So basically, one negative premise and a negative conclusion are synonymous with one another. You can either have a scenario like this or a scenario like this, but that's the, those are the only two ways that you're going to wind up with a negative conclusion. So we can summarize the four rules if I just add one more little brief here. You do get an, uh, a positive conclusion, but only when you get two positive premises. And if you can memorize this chart, you've memorized pretty much rules three and four. So let's try this. The upshot that of uh, number, rule number four is that you don't get negatives from positives. How about this? Instead of saying all NBA players are athletes and all athletes are healthy, therefore all uh, healthy people are NBA players, which we saw before committed the fallacy of illicit minor. Let's give it another shot. Let's wipe out this conclusion and try for another. Some healthy people are not NBA players. Does that follow from our premises? Not one bit. Again, that commits the fallacy of trying to get a negative from two positives. From positives, you only get a positive. So everything that I've had to say in this lecture can be summarized here in a nutshell. Uh, assuming that there's no existential fallacy to worry about, you've just got four issues to worry about, which can really be summarized in two. Uh, the first rule is to make sure the major, minor, and middle terms were distributed appropriately. When it comes to the major and minors, make sure that if they're distributed in the conclusion, they were distributed in the premises. And make sure the middle term got distributed in the premises at least once, no matter what. And the second rule regarding uh, positive and negative premises, make sure, and this is important, make sure a negative conclusion is drawn if and only if exactly one negative premise was in the argument. That pretty much summarizes the entire chart that I gave you before about positive negative premises and how they work. See if a negative conclusion was drawn if and only if there was exactly one negative premise in the argument. Now you've got a lot of ways now underneath your belt to test for validity. Uh, assuming no existential fallacy is committed uh, and these four rules are obeyed, the argument is valid. So check to see these rules were obeyed and then you can basically assume the argument valid regardless of whether you've done a, a Venn diagram or not. Isn't that convenient? So if you get really handy at these four rules, you can eyeball an argument and know whether it's valid or not. But if you uh, get tired of these technical methods, you can always lean back on our standbys. I gave you the neighbor's mnemonic uh, previously, and Venn diagrams were the subject matter of our last lesson. And now you have formal rules to study. So you have three techniques for telling whether or not an argument's valid. The neighbor's mnemonic, you can do a Venn diagram, or you can just check to make sure the four formal rules that we uh, studied a second ago were all followed. If so, the argument was valid. Well, I told you this would be a short lesson, but boy, there's a lot of technical material to, material to di digest, is there not? But well, it's getting too late at night, I'm afraid. Well, that's all for now. Wait for my exercises in my next logic lesson. In the end, keep logic chopping. Take care.